I believe with all my heart that God is inviting us tonight and over these next few hours that we have until tomorrow afternoon, hopefully into a place of deep reality. It's not an easy place to get to. And the reason is, is because in the lyrics of the song are perfect in this regard. We rush at the kind of distracting pace that makes it exceedingly difficult to listen either to God or to the rhythm of our own heart. And because that's the case, even when we're in church, in liturgy, it becomes for us not the kind of deep out of our heart invitation that God gives us. So we kind of rattle off the liturgy, we know it. And yet what doesn't happen is, is that it doesn't seep deeply into our souls, except for that kind of occasional moment, whether it's the word of absolution or where there's some match between what's happening inside and what's being vocalized in the liturgy, whether it's that joyful moment of lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord, or whether it's in that moment of the confession. Those for most of us in our churches are exceedingly infrequent experiences. So to say we want to move into something a little bit more transparent is I know a difficult thing. But you need to know that's, that's what I'm asking God for over the course of this time that we have together. A kind of transparency before the Lord himself. That takes us, however, to a real dilemma. And that is the dilemma of, do you actually want to be transparent before God? How do you perceive God? If you actually opened up the depths of your heart to him, what, what do you think he would do? Anything? And so what I want to do is lay out in the scriptures a contrast. And they're actually the two lessons that were appointed for today in the daily office. And so at this point, you need your Bibles. I'll get mine. By the way, um, the with open hands reference was intentional. A part of the thing that I, the themes that I'm using comes from this 30-year-old book now by Henri Nouwen called With Open Hands. I would highly, highly, but more on this tomorrow. So where we begin is in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. If you haven't been in the book of Ezekiel in a while, which probably most of us have it, actually, you have to just keep going through Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and eventually you get to Ezekiel. I could tell you the page number, but that would be worthless. Sorry. <laughs> 727 in the Chapel Bible. Thank you very much. Now, Ezekiel chapter 18. Now, it's important for us to think context. First of all, in both of the readings we're going to look at, because we're going to look at an intentionally set of contrasts between this Ezekiel reading and the prayers of Jesus, and that will take us over specifically into the Gospel of John. Remember, Ezekiel is a prophet to a people that are in desolation. They have been ravaged by marauding armies. They are people in dire straits by any definition. And so God raises up the prophet Ezekiel to both give them a vision for the future. Remember, the bones coming together. That's the, one of the most famous parts of the book of Ezekiel. So it's like, oh, it's really going to happen. We're not going to stay in this place forever. But also it's a profound call to repentance. 
Because Isaiah, under, I'm sorry, Ezekiel understands that the dire straits in which the nation of Israel is has everything to do with their own faithlessness. And so he speaks, in my mind, extraordinarily harsh words. But I read them tonight because for many of us, even though we call ourselves Christian, what Ezekiel says is in fact the very way we perceive God dealing with us. And believe me, if this is your picture of God, you're not going to want to come anywhere near it. At least that's been my experience. So, I'm, it's a long chapter and I'm not going to read all of it. All I'm going to do is in fact read the appointed reading for today, which skips the middle section. But the middle section is a litany of all of the ways Israel has broken the law of God. So, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, the reason we're in this mess is because our grandparents sinned. It's not really our fault. And Ezekiel will have nothing to do with this. As the Lord live, as I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. And it is only the person who sins that shall die. Oh, that's not so good. <laughs> now, drop down to verse 19. He lays out his case in these previous verses that in essence each one of us is responsible for our own sin. We can't blame our environment or our upbringing or our family or our parents. And, and we'll talk tomorrow a little bit about the role heritage plays as the way we think about our lives. But that's again tomorrow. And so he comes down and sort of makes it a little finer a point by saying in verse 19, and yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is lawful and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. The person who sins shall die. A child shall not suffer for the iniquity of a parent, nor a parent suffer for the iniquity of a child. The righteous of the righteous shall be his own, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be his own. But if the wicked turn away from all their sins that they have committed and keep my statutes and do what is lawful and right, they shall surely live. They shall not die. None of the transgressions they, that they have committed shall be remembered against them. For, righteous, for the righteous that they have done, they shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God? And rather, not that they should turn from their wickedness and live. But when the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, and do the same abominable things that the wicked do, shall they live? See, the answer is no. None of the righteous deeds that they have done shall be remembered for the treachery of which they are guilty and the sin they have committed, they shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Here now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from their wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they, are cons because they considered and turned away from all their transgressions that they have committed, they shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says the way of the Lord is unfair. O oh, house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me and get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn them and live. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I go, gee, thanks. How do I get a new heart? You see, the way Ezekiel lays it out, it's a zero-sum game. 
If you don't sin, you live. If you do sin, and if you don't repent, you die. Gosh, well, where does that leave me? And you. <laughs> I, I'm so extraordinarily conscious of the sins that I know I commit. Mm -hmm. And I like them. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons I keep doing them. It does, in fact, meet a need in me. I don't even know what I would look like if by some miracle I was separated from those sins. And so I play this game with myself, and you do too, where I commit the sin knowingly, intentionally, because I say, well, I know I can ask forgiveness later. And then the slate will be wiped clean. So, as Martin Luther says, sin boldly. <laughs> That's actually not the real context of the statement. <laughs> That's an off-quoted phrase. I, you see, what I, the more I understand myself, and I, I must confess to you that at 62 years of age, I feel like I still have a handle on all that is within me. That the whole call and act of repentance is slightly beyond my grasp. Oh, I know the obvious. And I can ask God's forgiveness for those things. And thank God he does forgive. <laughs> thank God he does forgive. But I, how can I repent of the things about which I know nothing? And broken human being that I am, I, I know there are things in my life that don't even begin to look like what this Bible describes as righteous. You see, righteousness, both in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, it is not just some kind of state of moral clarity. It has to do with a giving, kind, generous, servant heart. The righteous are those who literally give themselves away into the lives of other people. Which is why, if you go to Israel today, and you may know about this, there is this place where those who helped the Jews in, during the Holocaust are memorialized, and it's called what? The Hall of the Righteous. Because they risk their lives reaching out to the Jews in Europe in the midst of the Nazi wanting to do away with all Jews. In other words, it was that demonstrated sacrificial compassion that literally put themselves at risk that they describe as righteous. And biblically, they're right. In other words, you and I kind of think of righteousness as a, as a sort of internal moral description of the absence of committed sin. That ain't it. That's Puritanism. It's not biblical. Biblical has to do with generosity, biblical righteousness. Biblical righteousness has to do with compassion. Biblical righteousness has to do with being the one who takes care of the good Samaritan, the one leading and dying on the side of the road, the parable of the good Samaritan. The righteous are those who, as it says in 1 John, choose not to close up their heart of compassion in the face of human need, but instead step out and begin to give. That's biblical righteousness, which is why Jesus, in fact, is the righteous one who sacrificed himself. See the Franciscan cross up there? Who sacrificed himself for the sin, for out of sheer love for the broken, fallen human race and creation that we know of as planet Earth. That's why Jesus is described as Jesus Christ the righteous. It's not because he didn't commit adultery. 
It has to do with that kind of generosity. And so when Ezekiel is talking about being righteous, it's more than just adherence to the Judaic law in terms of separation and purity from pagan neighbors, fulfilling all of the dietary requirements, being faithful to worship. That's a part of it. But the genuine expression of righteousness is sacrificial generosity in the service of human need. So, hear that? The biblical definition of righteousness is sacrificial generosity in the face of human need. That's righteousness. No wonder you see Paul would say later, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Because almost all of us, at some level or another, take care of ourselves first, play it safe, don't act particularly generous. The whole idea of being Franciscan in any way, shape, or form, unless you're talking about communing with nature and preaching to the birds, is something that actually feels rather dangerously repugnant. And, and so, if I look at this Ezekiel passage, and see, in essence, this zero-sum game approach to either righteousness or iniquity, I feel absolutely caught in the thicket. I am the ram set up for sacrifice. I can't do it. But you see, if that's my perception of God, in the unease of knowing what lurks in my heart, do I, I want to open up my heart to that kind of transparency of God? Heck no. He might strike me dead. My worst fears might be realized. I'll walk away actually feeling worse than I did before. And therefore, there is this sense of being called to a place of transparency in my relationship with God. But the net result is, I don't know how to do that, and I don't even know that I want to. And so what it creates in me as a result of it is worship that is, in fact, flat, ritualistic in the worst description of the word. I cry out to God for help when I run out of gas and don't know what else to do. Or I see a friend who I genuinely care about and I know that I don't know what to do to help them, so I ask God to come in, in essence, cover for my inadequacy. In other words, I have a profoundly truncated understanding of prayer. And what that creates in me is this need in the midst of my own moral failure to just look good all the time. And so I create a facade. How are you? I'm doing really well. You know, I think the way you're dressed just makes me want to throw up. <laughs> In other words, there, there's, there's the inner dialogue, and then there's the outer dialogue, and believe me, they don't match. <laughs> Unless you run into one of those wonderful creatures, especially in the South, who happen to be older women, although it's, that's not always the case, who, are, who sort of say, you know, I'm old enough to speak my mind, and they do. <laughs> I know people like that. And so, as a result, we actually become extraordinarily fair sale. Because, and the reason is, is that we're trying to cover for ourselves. We know we're living, we can't live up to that which is being expected of us. We know enough to know that. And so what we do is create a kind of persona. It's armor, really. I put my best foot forward and because I want you to like me and I want to get along and I want to do well and so I know how to do that. I know how to work the room. I know how to be a person who knows how to somehow build relationships. But what doesn't happen in those moments in the midst of the banter about what's going on in the news or what happened to me yesterday and who I ran into at the grocery store is that my heart doesn't get shared. Because you see, I can't do that. I can't do that because I don't want to go there myself. So how in the world can I begin to say something like that to you? Because after all, if, 
if, if I begin to open my heart in a way like that, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I, a woman told me just in conversation, just a couple of nights ago over dinner, she said, you know, I, she, was, she actually shared with us some profoundly terrible things that are actually happening in her life. And she said, you know, but, but I'm not going to cry about it because if I start crying, I don't know that I'll ever be able to stop. That's what was there. See. And there are plenty of people who feel just like that. So they crack jokes or they don't, but they know what to do. They get along socially more or less. But there's a part of them that is locked down and inside. And because they're playing, and it's almost, it's almost like they've got a jack in the box. You know what a jack in the box is? <laughs> so what they do is that they expend an extraordinary amount of energy keeping all of that under lock and key. It's exhausting, actually. For some, it's even a prelude to depression. Because you feel so extraordinarily alone. Unless you fill your brain with the television all day long, or your earbuds, or whatever's going on, a life full of activity, and more often than not, a life that's preoccupied with other people's feelings. Because you're working the angle of somehow, if I keep the focus on what other people are not doing, or doing badly, maybe nobody will see the real me. And it has everything to do, everything to do, with knowing that the Almighty God to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, is actually not the God I really want to get to know. I just hope I go to church and hope for the best. If your view of God is the zero-sum game of Ezekiel, look at the contrast now. Turn with me to John 17. And I want to make one more comment before I move on. It is possible to have that view of God in your heart of hearts, even though you know all of the right answers to that perception in your brain. You can quote the right Bible verses. You can talk gospel. And yet there is a part of you that still, in your heart of hearts, believe that God is in essence Santa Claus in the sky who is making a list and checking it twice. Mm -hmm. And so, and I, I want to say at a very personal level, that was me. That was me. That's how I thought about God. And I didn't come to a different realization until my second year of seminary. But I'm sitting there talking to a friend in a late night conversation, which often happens, at least among single people in seminary. The best theology happens after 10 o'clock over a beer, or something <laughs> like that. And we began to banter back and forth. And my friend, who was extraordinarily perceptive, dangerously so, said to me, you, you know, Greg, when I hear you talk and, and listen to you pray, meaning ex extemporaneously, I, I have this sense that the way you think about life is, you, you're, the goal of life is you're on a tightrope and you're trying to get from point A to point B. And it's dangerous and pretty scary up there. And yeah, there, there's grace, meaning you have a balance beam that you're holding on to, and there's a neck, you're not going to fall and die. But you're really up there all by yourself. And I went. It was one of those things where I knew it was true. And it was like, oh, John, you're, you're more right than I want to admit. And at that much, at that point, I knew enough scripture, theology, and the like to realize that, in fact, what I had done inadvertently over the years, was crafted this kind of Ezekiel view of God. And that is the one to whom my heart related. Even though the prayers I prayed 
I mean, the prayer book liturgy about God and how God is pre presented, presented, particularly through the Collex of Cranmer, is exactly the opposite. Full of compassion and mercy, a heart of love. I mean, that's, that's in fact, Cranmer's gift to Protestant Christianity is a picture of God that really does represent compassion in Christ. And I had to say, God, wow, I've, in fact, created an idol, an idol of my own making. I don't know that I'm actually even talking to you, Lord. I actually think I'm addressing my perception of you. And I think it could be different. That's what idolatry really is, you see. It's not just sort of kneeling in front of some statue. It's talking and addressing deity and understanding that deity to be someone other than that which has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And so I had to say, Lord, I need to know who you really are. Not what my heart believes, but who you really are. See, Jesus makes an extraordinary promise. And he says, in, again, in the Gospel of John, I think it's 14, that the Holy Spirit would lead and guide us into all truth. Okay, that's exactly what I need. And I, in fact, need to be led because I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to go from where I am to where you might really be. That's how I thought about it. So listen to a little bit of who this one is in the face of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to read the entire passage. Instead, what I want to do is just take a few pieces. Now remember, what's the context? Does anybody know? When did Jesus offer these words? Hello? That's right. We're talking about the Last Supper. This is in some ways in John, the climax of all that happened over the course of that dinner. If you go to some of the synoptic readings, it's more about bread and wine. Here, it's about foot washing, first of all, and then this extraordinary picture of the prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. Different emphasis. And after that prayer is when they take off to the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. John has a different purpose, you see, going on than talking about Jesus as sacramental bread and wine. You have to go to another gospel for that one. Instead, what he's trying to do is create and make very, very clear this undivided unity between Father and Son. That's the goal of John. And in so doing that, that we might believe. John's is a very evangelistic evangelist in that sense. And so this chapter, this high priestly prayer, as it is often called, is meant to give us a window into the communion between God the Father and God the Son. It's almost a prayer characterized as something outside of time, even though it's located very clearly and directly in the Gospel reading as something that happens within the context of this Eucharistic meal, the Last Supper, the Seder. And while that's important, because what's the point of the Seder? Two things. For Jews, it affirms identity. Who are we? A wandering Aramean was my father, as the Haggadah begins. In other words, I am, regardless of where I might be on planet Earth, I am still a child of Abraham. And, the second thing is, it affirms the covenantal relationship that exists between God and the people of Israel. That's what the Seder is meant to affirm, identity and covenant. And so it is not coincidental that within the context of a meal that is meant to communicate identity and covenant, Jesus washes feet. Who does it? He does it. That's a different understanding of identity, does it, is it not? 
God is not as in Ezekiel, lofty on high. What's the line? I love it. Who sits on the circle of the earth and beholds human beings as grasshoppers. <laughs> no, no, no. This is the one who in the word made flesh, see that's a John phrase, takes off his clothes, wraps the towel around his waist, and washes the feet of his disciples. This is, to quote actually Luke, God with us. In a very deep, real, and personal way. And so that's what we see in this prayer, because what we see in this prayer is Jesus just there praying with and for us. He's, he's not there. Even though the prayer is characterized as something larger than this event, it's almost outside of time. It's eternity breaking into the present. And in fact, there are little editorial comments that John makes in the prayer that makes it very clear that this is something for all of us. It wasn't just a prayer specifically for the disciples, you see. And so we have a different picture of God. Not contradictory, but something wildly new. So that in Jesus, something is accomplished that has not been accomplished so that he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I didn't know that there was that kind of Father. So, Jesus prays. After Jesus has spoken these words, he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you. How was Jesus glorified? In the supreme sacrificial act of death on the cross. Righteousness manifested and visible. So that the Son may be glorified you since you have given him authority over all people. He is, remember John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of what? The world. The world. The world. That's right. Authority over all people. See, if you didn't have authority, you could not be the sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world. To give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And then, editorial comment, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Back to the prayer of Jesus, I have glorified you on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. In other words, what we're seeing in Jesus is in fact what has always been eternally true. In other words, Jesus didn't shapeshift and act like somebody different when the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us in about 3 BCE. It, it, there's an exact likeness of the invisible God, as Paul says in Colossians, that's going on here. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. But the other thing that Jesus offers in these opening lines is a gift that we've received. What is going on? To be in him is to mean that the flame of eternity is resonant within our souls. I mean, now think about this. The flame of eternity is resonant within our souls. That when I enter into that place of prayer, I'm not somehow hoping that, you know, my, my, my long ball actually finally makes it through the clouds into heaven that if somehow maybe God's paying attention and I'm good enough to warrant his observance, he's going to actually listen. And that's how many of you see, think about prayer. Do I qualify? And do I say it right? Little aside. In the middle of my freshman year of college, I came to, into a profound conversion experience. It all didn't actually finally unpack, or at least begin to unpack, until my second year of seminary. But with the moment that I just described. But I was like Simon Magus. I was hungry for the power of God. And there was this fellow that a friend of mine brought in who was deeply gifted in the healing ministry. And we were 20 or 30 of us in a living room. And he was walking around praying for people. And he would pray lay hands on somebody, and he would say, so and so and such and such, 
In the name of Jesus, amen. And I saw people literally healed right in front of my eyes mm. in this quiet little living room. Well, I thought, that's what is wrong with me. I've never prayed in the name of Jesus. I've prayed in Jesus' name. <laughs> <laughs> so that must be the secret. You see. I need to change my phraseology. I mean, if, I mean, if you're hungry and you don't know better, which I didn't at the age of 19, uh, it, it's like you wind up thinking that it's an issue of technique. Mm -hmm. And it has everything to do with the absence, you see, of understanding that in Christ Jesus, he has placed eternity within our souls. That what flows out of your innermost being, again, quoting John, what is it? Oh, come on. The river of living water welling up into eternal life. That, that, that I don't have to try to hope my long ball is going to actually make it into the kingdom. Rather, just the opposite. When I, when I stand in prayer, this posture is exactly what's going on in that moment. Where is he? Man, he's here, and, and he's here, and he's here, and he's here, and he's here. St. Patrick's breastplate. Christ above me, beneath me, behind me, in front of me. I mean, that is the living reality. He is the one in whom I live and move and have my being. That Christ in you is the hope of glory. And that's true regardless of the caliber of my behavior. Oh. You see, in the zero-sum game of Ezekiel, God only pays attention to me when I do what he wants. And there isn't a day, day that doesn't go by when I somehow, at some point or another, either consciously or unconsciously, don't do what he wants. Whether it be sins of commission or omission, especially if righteousness is fine, defined as self-sacrificial generosity. Because who am I? I'm the guy with the list that needs to get things done. Appointments, places I have to go. I must confess to you more often than I care to imagine, and these are the ones I know about. I'm not the guy who stops to help out the people on the side of the road. They need to go to Salvation Army. Right? <laughs> Besides, I've got places to go. And so, am I righteous, as it is defined in both the Old and the New Testament? Not at the behavioral level. But if I understand that in the midst of what I know of my sin, much less what I don't want to know, and therefore don't make the time to discover. Right? Not your head. <laughs> that in the midst of all of the reality of what it means for me to be Greg Brewer, the human being, somehow trying to figure out what it means both to be a Christian and to be a bishop. That I'm somehow within the context of a God who is both shaping, changing, Direct, and this is all of what gets laid out in 17. That I, I literally am in his companionship. And that companionship is not predicated on the caliber of my behavior. What can separate us from the love of Christ, to quote Romans? And the, rhetorical, the answer to that rhetorical question is nothing, no one, no how. That gives me the courage that I need, you see, to be able to face the things in myself that I don't want to face. And to be able to come to Him in those places in my life that I would just soon leave. And to know that there really are vistas in God 
that I have yet to even begin to apprehend. <laughs> In fact, I must tell you, the more I know, the more I know I don't know. And it's not that I'm trying to move a field from what has been revealed in Jesus. It's just that I'm still at the starting gate, just come out trying to be a child, put one foot in front of the other, who desperately wants to be an adult and in control in need of nothing. Which, of course, is counter to what it means to be a Christian. <coughs> so I'm having to be a learner. One last story. This gets back to the place of transparency. When I grew up in suburban Richmond, Virginia, our, the place where we lived had manhole covers out front. They're almost a thing of the past unless you live in an old city. But that was the sewer system. Mm -hmm. And since I lived in a neighborhood that was relatively quiet, we kids could actually walk out in the street and look at the manhole cover. Now, I'm seven, eight at the time. You know what we would do? We love to do this. We would make up the scariest stories <laughs> of what was down underneath that manhole cover. We, and, we, and we would almost sort of competitively glory in how terrifying it actually could be. We were ruthless. Because kids can be, you know. And I was kind of laughing one day about that and telling that story to a group of clergy. I was in, in fact, a therapy support group here in the city of Orlando with a wonderful Presbyterian therapist by the name of Dick Erickson, who is still in practice, as amaz amazingly enough. And we paid him, we four clergy, I think it was like $50 each, to meet for two hours with him, where we could literally unload anything and get the support of one another and listen and get his almost always very, very solidly grounded observances. And so I'm telling that story and kind of laughing about it. I don't even remember the context. And one member of the clergy looked at me and he said, you know, Greg, and he was ruthless because he kept the banter tone, even though what he was about to say was deadly serious, which means I couldn't shut it off. He said, you know, Greg, I hope one day you get to go down in that manhole cover and see what's really there. <gasps> oh my God. It was like everything inside of me just went like this. Because, of course, what was he talking about? The stuff in here that I didn't want to see. But... I know at least enough to know that there are times when a, a comment like that happens, that it is in fact the direction of the Holy Spirit. And I said, and at that point I knew enough about God to know, okay, I think I can trust you with this, even though I think it's really terrifying. And I said, okay, God, if, if you want to open the cover and go down with me, please, with me, uh, I'm willing to go down and see what's and I, in fact, made an appointment to get with someone who was very, very gifted in the area of healing prayer. And I told that story, and I said, so I'm, I'm willing to see what it is that God might want to show me. Was I frightened? Yes. But not so frightened that I didn't want to do it. But what happened, really quite astonishing, was that all of a sudden, I was eight years old. And that heavy manhole cover, somehow I was able, you know, this is just in my mind's eye, I was able to put it off. Never could have done that, of course, except. And I saw a light down the side going down into what was real darkness, and I heard water running. And so I thought, okay, here goes. And I literally saw myself walking down the ladder. I got to the bottom and my feet hit damp ground. And then my eyes began to adjust to the shadows of what I could see around me. And I saw this light kind of around the corner sort of glowing out like this. And, and so I began to walk over and I turned the corner and who I saw was Jesus. And he was more than happy 
to, in essence, reveal parts of my life that I actually really needed to see. Were they pretty? Actually, no. But, because I was able to see them in his companionship, I wasn't afraid. I really wasn't afraid. And it opened up a whole new vista for me, both in terms of prayer and counseling and some real healing work that needed to happen inside of my heart. I, I knew that I could trust him, you see. At that point, I knew that I could trust him. Do I always know that? No. Sometimes I really step back into a place of self-protection and fear, denial, and a lot of busyness. Because I, I, there still is, in fact, part of me that is trying to prove my worth by what I do. But I know that that is, in fact, a sin tendency. One that's profoundly rewarded by just about everything. So the question I want to ask as we bring my presentation to a close is, how do you see God? Are you willing to take some time tonight to get silent and really think about what your heart says? About who God is? What do you think of when I say to you, I'd like to invite you into a place of transparency. Will you like the song, Sit and Weep a While? You might. Will you like the song, Feel a Deeper Sense of Peace and Notice the Song of the Birds and the Stars? And, yeah, I, I, I'm in God's world. And it's, it's okay. You see, we don't know. We can't project into the future what happens when we're willing to come into that place where we are there in his name. But I, I want to say to you, you who were courageous enough and trusting enough to come into this retreat space, because this is a retreat, it's not a conference, that tells me that there's a part of you that is willing to take a little bit of a step forward and not on a tight rope, but to discover in taking those steps forward that what you discover is a new place of solid ground. That's the invitation of this weekend, this time, this Friday evening and Saturday. It's a courageous thing to do, and it's not easy to do. I have no illusions about that. And tomorrow, in fact, as we begin, a part of what we'll do, looking at this book particularly, some of the analogies, is why going from this in the presence of God to this can be really extraordinarily difficult. It's a different analogy, but the very same invitation that I'm talking about tonight. But unless we're willing to walk into this, the invitation of Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, will always be slightly beyond us. We'll experience the longing for that, as if one longs for a different country. But it will still elude us. That is not what I hope for you. What I hope for you is that you come into a new place of rest. The theme of tonight and this weekend is God's assurance, our adventure. But there is no adventure, or very little, for people who live like this. I'm defending. I'm not giving. So with that in mind, what I'd like uh, Josh to do is to come again and invite us to sing. We will do complaint together. And we will conclude. I'm going to hang out after complaint. If anybody, if, if people want to gather and just talk a little bit about this, instead of going back, we're free to do that. Uh, I'll hang out for a little while. Or again, if you want to 
write questions down, put them in the fish back in the dining hall. You're welcome to do that as well. And then, uh, again, 7.30 will be morning prayer, breakfast at 8, and 9 o'clock will be our opening session here back in this room.